the ecology of resilience. And this, this lecture is dedicated to the memory of a dear friend, the late Mr. Wisinto, who was the founding chairman of the Mind Science Centre, a former NUS vice president, and um, the first person to introduce uh, mindfulness to the NUS students. He was always a strong supporter of the therapeutic garden. Last year, the former director of mental health from the World Health, Professor Norman Sartorius, came to Singapore to deliver the first Tao Tian Seng lecture. And the topic was on mental resilience. And he defined resilience in two categories. First, the resilience of the individual, and secondly, the resilience of the community. The resilience um, let me see. And the, um, the resilience of the individual is an individual's ability to adapt in the face of adverse condition. And the individual resilience of the community is the ability of a system to withstand change in its environment and still function. So it is now we're in the midst of the pandemic. Can we still remain resilient? I certainly think we can. And we are very fortunate here in Singapore that there is a mental resilience program for our seniors. And this program is, is called the Age Well Everyday Program. And this program was started at Jurong, and uh, there's tremendous research done, and the evidence based, and the papers are published in the world's journal, including The Lancet. And there are three important elements of this program. One, health education, understanding what is diabetes, hypertension. Secondly, exercise. And thirdly, mindfulness. There are now about eight centres around Singapore with this program. And each of the centres have their other activities, including art, music, and gardening. And um, the study on gardening was conducted here at the Hot Park. Um, and it's a, a, a big study, and important finding of this study was that gardening can improve gardening can improve our immune system, and this has been published in the World's Journal. And three months ago, we were invited by um, the BBC in London to give an interview on our research finding. Having done the first study, and here in, in the Hot Park. National Parks introduced the therapeutic garden. And we are so glad that now, besides one, there are more than five uh, um, therapeutic gardens around the island. And so this picture is, uh, you can see a very uh, energetic um, Minister Desmond Lee uh, um, with uh, Minister Gan Kim Yong at the Bishan Park. The next area of research, the new frontier of research that well, we are in, in is the uh, therapeutic forest. This idea came about after a, a discussion, a lunch discussion with uh, the chairman of N Parks, Benny Lim, and our former Speaker of Parliament, Abdul Tambuji. It was over a, a delicious curry fish head lunch at Dempsey Road. And it, an idea germinated that maybe we should do a study on the forest. So the proposal was that we invite 20 friends to walk through the rain of the botanic gardens and find out what happened to them after 10 weeks. 10 consecutive, consecutive weeks on a Saturday morning at 7 o'clock. Um, will it change your health? Uh, we're not too sure, but we started this study. There are many other studies in the world on the forest. In Japan, they call it forest bathing. In America, forest therapy. But what is so unique and what's so special about the Singapore study are three elements. Firstly, there is mindful walking. And this is where the late Mr. Wee Sin To and his wife, Gyokhua, taught us how to walk mindfully through the rainforest. 
often we walk through the forest without understanding or knowing the trees around us. And this is where NPARCS help us out. We have two friends, Mr. Uh, Maxwell and Paul, who will accompany us. And they'll tell us, that is the Julongtong tree. That is the Maranti tree. And they'll tell us about the medicinal value of these trees. This is very important because often, even as you drive along the roads in Singapore, which are lined with beautiful trees, we don't know what's the name of the trees. And I'm told that um, in the botanic gardens, there are more than 1,500 species of, plant, uh, of plants and 400 species of birds. And this is phenomenal in, in, in the forest, in the forest to, to learn. And after two hours of walking, they adjourn to their favourite watering hole, having coffee or tea. And there is no idle talk. Every week, there is a focused topic. One week, maybe on diet. Another week, on diabetes. The third week, on hypertension, falls, how to sleep better. So this went on for 10 weeks. Um, after 10 weeks, what happened? I assessed them at three levels. The physical health, the mental health, and the social health. So this is a small study. It's a qualitative study. I compare this group with a group in Chinatown, which I uh, examined several years ago. This is the biggest study, the first study in Singapore on dementia amongst the old people at Chinatown, um, a sample size of 612. This is both a quantitative and a qualitative study. So you see that um, obviously there's a difference. The NAMA study, um, the Nature and Mindfulness Awareness study, mainly middle class people whereas the Chinatown study may need the working class people. But why is it important? Because every time I present the Singapore da data in a world conference, someone from the World Health will say, those data are of the working class in Singapore, from Topayo, Jurong, or Ang Mo Kio. You know. The world, even from China, India, Europe, or North America, they don't have the data of the middle class people. And the World Health tell all of us that the middle class in China has ballooned. More than 56 million people uh, belong to the middle class, even in India. But not many people know about the health services or the health consumption. But we know in all these countries, the health service consumption is highest among the middle class. So uh, we see that um, in this group here, uh, for musculoskeletal discomfort or pain, they have aches pain, muscle uh, uh, strains. Among the NAMAS group, which is Nature and Mindful Awareness group, 30%, the Chinatown, 12 Why is that so? Most of the people here, the middle class people, they are more living, having sedentary job. They are a senior government of, of official. Oh, sorry, I got back to it. There's... Senior uh, civil servants, doctors, uh, uh, professors, even bank, uh, bankers, um, more sedentary jobs. So they have more of this discomfort compared to this group. You know. And so many of these people who are middle class, whenever I ask them, you have a back problem, what do you do? They say, well, I see my doctor. I will probably ask for an MRI scan of my, my spinal column, which is quite costly. But what about the people here when I interviewed them? Uh, the Chinatown elderly, well, if I have back pain, I'll just go to the local traditional Chinese shop. I'll ask for a, a they'll buy, they'll sell me a, a, a tube of a tiger balm. I'll just rub it down. I'll not ask for an MRI scan. It's too expensive. And you see also the, the, the prevalence of hypertension, diabetes higher amongst the, the middle class. But what happened after 10 weeks? The prevalence of musculoskeletal discomfort came to just 10%. And all of them with hypertension, diabetes, were well controlled. For mental health, I used a questionnaire used by the World Health, World Health Organization, the General Health Questionnaire. If you score more than four points on the GHQ, you have a mental health problem, commonly depression or, de or anxiety. But here in this study, 80% have just one or two points. Most of them, all of them are normal, except for, and their symptoms are mainly of sleep difficulty or sometimes a bit of anxiety. And only one person has a score of three points. What happened after 10 weeks? This number came down to just 30% and the person with three points came to just one point. And none of them, none of them have any evidence of any cognitive decline. 
what happened to the um, social health, right? In the beginning of the study, they don't know each other, most of them, but now they're able to have more social connectivity. And in the midst of the pandemic now, they begin to care for one another. Um, there are few people in this group who are widows or widowers. You know? And uh, the more able-bodied one will volunteer to buy the mask for them, buy groceries for them, or even take medicine for them from hospitals. And um, their sense of gratitude because they've, they decided to form a virtual choir and to thank our healthcare workers. Yeah, I think that's quite tremendous for them. You know. And also, at the end of the, of the 10 week walk, they thought that since the national parks have been so kind to them, you know, uh, Mr. Wee Sinto said we should, we should thank them with a donation. So he passed the hat around for a donation, and we gave a, a donation to the national parks. And um, the national park agreed that we should plant 30 medicinal trees here in a hot park. I think that's, that's tremendous, I think, the, the collaboration between national parks and the, um, and the Mind Science Centre. Someone asked me, what is the benefit of this study? What is the benefit of this study to the community? There are two very important benefits. Building social capital and mental capital. Social capital and mental capital are important in the ecology of resilience in the community. Social capital, meaning that you know your friends, there's a social cohesion, they'll take care of you. Mental capital. Now, although the mean age of this group is 68 years old, 80% of them are working part-time or full-time. This is a very important fact because in Singapore, there is a popular misconception that people above 65 are retired and not economically productive. They are a burden to society. Far from it. 80% are still working part-time or full-time and contributing to the economy. And this is um, a very important fact in the in ecology of resilience. Several years ago, I was invited by the Indonesian government to help out in the tsunami when it struck Aceh. And, um, and uh, the doctors in Aceh told me that not all the shorelines down there are destroyed by the tidal wave. Certain parts of the shorelines were well preserved because of the mangrove trees. The mangrove trees have deep roots that protect the shoreline from the tsunami. And they also told me that in, in, in Sumatra and Java, they, are, they frequently have earthquakes. And the earthquakes could topple tall buildings, but they will not knock down the tall trees in the rainforest. There's something about the rainforest. The trees have deep roots, and the roots are all cling together and able to withstand the, uh, the tidal wave. This is a very important metaphor for society on ec ecology of resilience. If society are linked together, the strong cohesion then is likely to, to crumble under calamity. I love to go to the, um, the National Art Gallery, and I'm so glad that Chairman Mr. Siafu Hua is here. And in the Art Gallery, there's a room for, for children to, to paint. It's, 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 it's called the, uh, the Capel Art Room. And I'll bring my grandchildren there to, to, to do some painting, and they do a painting of trees, and you see the trees all linked together. Yeah. All right. The roots are all linked together. But what actually holds a society, holds a community together? I think there are three important, three important elements, and these are faith, hope, and love. Faith meaning trust, trust in your family, your neighbours, your, um, your uh, friends, and also trust in the frontline workers and um, trust in the authorities. And this will stir up a, a sense of, um, of hope and love or compassion. And the book will be launched in a few minutes' time. And in the book, there's a line that says, we never actually own the rainforest. We merely look after it for the next generation. I want to thank the NPARCs for helping us with this uh, research, this study. Mr. William Hunstead is a retired American senator living here in Singapore. 
And um, for the last 30 years, his children are all grown up, all in the medical profession. And he wants to thank uh, Singapore uh, and give us a donation for this study. And also, I will thank the N Parks for volunteers and also the Mind Science Centre. I presented this idea in a, in a world conference two years ago in Mexico City. The chairman of the, of the conference was a professor from Brazil. He told me this is a marvellous idea because he said that one of the causes of global warming is the destruction of the rainforest. And if people begin to love the rainforest and they will not want to burn it down, then it's wonderful for the world. He told us that in Brazil, the Amazon rainforest is 10,000 times the size of Singapore. Uh, people are destroying it. You know. If we can do something for the forest, that would be wonderful. Namas is a small step in the ecology of resilience in Singapore. And if it is adopted by more countries around the world, it can be a giant step for humanity. Thank you.